Oh, it's about particular spaces and particular times. Because the regulations that do this are time-based, they keep changing. Like on some Wednesdays, it's okay to have three ounces of, of face cream, but then next month, the three ounces of face cream is like totally verboten. And then like something bumps up into the orange zone because it's now orange season, and suddenly two ounces of face cream become as absolutely forbidden as the bondage cuffs, right? I mean, we're, we're like into a, an area here where our relationship to these artifacts is being sort of violently maneuvered for basically political reasons. And there's no argument or discussion allowed. It's not that we get to sort of debate it. It's more like they're made non-objects and kind of vanished. So, you know, I don't exactly call them atemporal, but I recognize the free song that I'm getting from these as being somehow, you know, mildly related to the frisson I'm getting from this. I mean, this is forbidden to me for like reasons of physics or something, or just because it doesn't work. You know, and this is forbidden to me because somebody imagines that it might work for some particularly fantastic end, like that I could destroy a skyscraper, perhaps wreck the Pentagon with my duct tape. And your handcuffs. And my handcuffs. I mean, we mustn't forget the handcuffs. You know, you know and I love it that they're, they, they're, that they're given such a conspicuous, I mean, these instruments of sexual bondage, you know? I mean, they're fur-lined wrist restraints. You know, I mean, they're like, they're into a realm of porn. You know, they're not really something that you would use. You know, it's like you're like, you're gonna rush the cabin, you know? It's, <laughs> I mean, in theory, you could, you know. I mean, it would be super interesting to see, like, an Al-Qaeda hijacking in which they were all dressed in, it's like, say, latex fetish gear, you know, or they were, they were both, like, you know, murderous, self-annihilating Muslim terrorists and also members of a sexual underworld, you know, and that you're, like, moving into, like, Warren Ellis territory there, you know, but... I mean, somebody curated this. They curated this display in much the same way that that ray gun curated. You know, and you can't touch them. You know, and they're in the middle of the airport. You know, and in the vitrine. So they're sort of, they're kind of like super. I mean, people stop and stare at them. You know, and there's there's a, you know there's like a, an intense political and social message being associated with these objects. That's like scissors. You know, scissors. The scissors are in a space of non scissorness. No, I, I'm not. I mean, I'm really struggling with this, you know, and I would, I would appreciate help, you know, because it really needs something like a semiotic reading, you know, and, and, and I'm serious. I mean, it, it really, I mean, this is one of the areas in society where a, where a good solid postmodern analysis can really help us, you know, and, and, it, and it's not, well, in any case, you know, and I, and I and I differentiate these from this, although to, to the to the to the naked eye they're doing a rather similar thing. This I don't believe is particularly atemporal, and this is basically a silly gadget. It's a pen. It's a fountain pen disguised as a hypodermic needle. Pen syringe, one euro eighty. So you know, I took a picture of this because it was doing something to me, and I wasn't quite sure what. Um, you know, and then I realized it was sort of a really good thing to like sign a cyberpunk novel with. You know, that, I, there, that there were like areas in which I could deploy an object like this and it would really mess with people's heads. You know, it's like you go to a bookstore signing, it's like, oh, Mr. Sterling, you know, really loved your book tomorrow now about the shape of the next 50 years. Could you possibly inscribe that to me? Like, what's your name? Matthew. Okay, Matthew, and then you whip out the hypodermic needle, <laughs> right? I mean, that would like make people take three steps back. You know, even though it's like small and cheap and probably not a very good pen and basically, you know, a drugstore novelty. So, you know, why would it work, you know, in that way? Well, you know, it's because it's taking an object from an area of practice, medicine, and also illicit drugs, and moving it into another area, you know, literary composition or simply drawing, where you don't really expect to have the affect of narcotics. 
but of course there's a lot of writing about narcotics, right? I mean, this would be sort of perfect for William Burroughs, you know? Instead of sitting there, he's whipping out naked lunch, you know, pausing to shoot up some ink, you know? If you ever saw the Cronenberg Burroughs where he's kind of got like the carnivorous typewriter, so, you know, the Cronenberg movie adaptation of Naked Lunch, with the sort of mutant typewriters. Okay, this is in that kind of whimsical slash subversive space. And, you know, it gives you the same kind of lure of the forbidden in some kind of way that this does, right? So, you know, it's a design intervention and it's subversive and it has a certain sort of underground cachet and it's also wry commentary, and it's metaphorical, and it's darkly suggestive, and it would be a useful thing for cyberpunks to have, but it's not atemporal. Right? This is not an atemporal object. It's basically a silly gadget. Okay, now there's this. This is a flea market in Turin. And this guy is an Arab emigre, probably a clandestini or a semi-clandestini, an illegal emigre, an undocumented guy. And he's selling cell phones and cell phone parts from a blanket in the street. So, you know, what is happening here? Well, you know, this is sort of a object correlative for the famous William Gibson dictum that the street finds its own uses for things because you don't get a lot more street than an illegal emigre selling possibly stolen technical objects off a blanket. And so there are lots of them, and he's not the only guy there. In fact, there's an entire row of basically cell phone flea market, fence, trash dots. Right? So what are we looking at here? Okay, we're looking at economic migration. We're looking at globalization. We're looking at economic trickle down because these used to be expensive objects that are now sort of cheap enough for the lumpen proletariat. We're looking at an aftermarket. We're looking at a black market. We're looking at a flea market. We're looking at high technology transformed into near rubbish, but not actual rubbish because it sells. I mean, you see people buying these things and they work. They work by the standards of 1995. <coughs> So they're old-fashioned by our standards, but by the standards of 1965, they work by almost miraculous intensity. I mean, they're not high-tech by our particular standards, but in one standard, they were very high-tech, and they're still very functional. So this is high-tech, low-life. It's the street finding its own uses for things. Is it atemporal? Where is the time stream here? Is it the nature of technology that technology always comes from the top of the economic pyramid and then trickles down over a period into the hands of the underclass? If that's the case, then you ought to be able to clock it and you ought to be able to say, okay, well, you know, it was new then and now it's, it was new and expensive and now it's old and cheap. But what about the reverse version? What happens for techno innovations that climb upward through the class system that are actually pioneered by poor people, the excluded, emigres, and so forth, and then rise up and are actually used by the wealthy? There aren't a lot of those, but there are some. And in the third world, you've seen a lot of cell phone innovation, like shared phones, Grammy bank phones, and especially mobile banking which is actually being pioneered among people who had never used banks and will probably move into the hands of people who had banks later, right? So, you know, where does the course of time go? I mean, you know, my feeling is that like most atemporal things are sort of against our expected course of time, or they're doing political and social things to our expectations about time, or they're actually very old or very new or just temporally anom anomalous. I'm not quite sure where to place this. It's doing something very interesting and significant. I could write about it all day. I don't know if it's atemporal. I mean, is that what we're seeing here? Is that part of the cachet that